Welcome to an introduction to oceanography from the textbook Essentials of Oceanography written by Tom Garrison and Robert Ellis. This is the eighth edition of the textbook brought to you by Cengage Learning. And this lecture is An Ocean World. I'm your professor, Dave Cacciarella, and we're going to begin a comprehensive study of oceanography, the ocean, the ocean basins, the composition of ocean water. And it was thought for many centuries that the world was composed of the seven seas and seven different ocean basins, the North and South Atlantic, North and South Pacific, the Arctic, the Antarctic, known as the Southern Ocean and the Indian Ocean. That's all changed now as oceanographers and geographers and even anthropologists understand that it is one world ocean and that ocean mixes and swirls and interacts and on a continuous basis. And we're going to learn lots more about that and how the oceans were formed and how they are changing. But first, the main concepts of chapter one have to do with science and doing good science versus doing bad science. Some of the broader theories of the universe and the formation of the solar system and the planets, oceans, the origins of life, and a few other concepts that we'll get into. This is an oceanography class. It is the science of oceanography, and we'll be covering everything from plate tectonics to the salinity of the ocean. So, in chapter one, science is a systematic process of asking questions about the observable world by gathering and then studying information. Science interprets raw information by constructing a general explanation with which the information is compatible. Explanations, which would be theories, may change as our knowledge and powers of observation change. Thus, all scientific understanding uh, is tentative. And this is an important concept when we look at this, uh, this idea of science, that all of our scientific knowledge is tentative. It's tentative because if new information comes around or we have better abilities to observe the natural world around us, then we have to be able to change our understanding of science. We have to be able to change our theories. So explanations change as our knowledge and our powers of observation change. The universe is observable mass consists mostly of hydrogen. That's right. Virtually everything in the universe is hydrogen. Sure, you're looking at uh, some concrete or maybe some, some skin or some hair or a table or some wood or some steel or some glass. But when we take a look at all the mass of the universe, it's mostly hydrogen, the simplest and the lightest element. The heavier elements that we see all around us, those other ones that I uh, described, they were all constructed in stars. Everything that you see, including yourself, had its origins and its beginning in stars, either stars or the original Big Bang itself. Our solar system is the result of an accumulation of elements formed in stars and distributed into space by cataclysmic events at the end of those stars' lives. And we're going to talk about the life cycle of stars here uh, in just a couple of minutes. Some of the other concepts from Chapter 1, the fact that Earth is density stratified. That means as the Earth formed, gravity pulled the heaviest stuff, the iron and the nickel, to the center of the Earth, making the core. And the lighter materials got pushed out due to heat to the surface, like aluminum and silicon and oxygen. Earth's first solid surface theoretically formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Other concepts, through though most of the Earth's water was present in the solar system uh, during the solar nebula, the development of the uh, solar system, uh, a barrage of icy comets or asteroids from other parts of the solar system colliding with Earth may have also been a contributing factor to the ocean that developed. We're also thinking that life probably originated in the ocean and that water, even liquid water, appears to be present in at least a few other locations in our solar system. All right, Earth is an ocean world. More than 97% of the water on Earth lies in ocean. So for however many billion gallons, gazillion gallons, trillions of gallons, gillions of gallons, 97% of that is all in the ocean. If all the water at the Earth's surface were gathered into a sphere, its diameter would measure only about 1,380 kilometers or 860 miles across. So all of the water, 97% of it, 97.5% of it is salt water. 2.5% of it is fresh water. Of the fresh water, about 69% exists in the glaciers. Another 30% exists in the groundwater. So this very tiny amount exists as freshwater lakes. This, this sliver, like 0.4% 
is at the surface or in the atmosphere. And of that 0.4% of all the fresh water, which only represents 2.5% of all the water, of that, 67% is in the freshwater lakes, and you can see only 9.5% in the atmosphere. We get 8.5% in wetlands, 1.6% in uh, rivers, and there's atmospheric water as well. Bottom line is, all the water on the earth, most of it's salt water, not a lot of fresh water. The Earth's distance from the sun allows for water to exist in all three forms, and that's incredibly important. Without water in all three forms, life wouldn't exist, and that's a largely a function of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. Beneath this very thin atmosphere, a very thin layer around the Earth is the atmosphere. Most of Earth's surface is covered by a saline liquid water ocean that averages somewhere between uh, 10 and 15,000 feet deep. The average ocean depth is 12 1,451 feet deep. The ocean has few dependable natural divisions. It's really just one large body of water. Now, we may think of the oceans as being set where they are, but we know as we look at geologic uh, evidence and geologic time that the continents uh, have moved, not the continents themselves, uh, the, the plates that the continents rest on have moved. So the continents have not always been in the configuration they are. So those natural divisions are not permanent. So really the ocean is just one large great body of water. So the names of the oceans and seas are really just a human construct. In reality, there is only one world ocean. Once again, here is another slide giving you that same perspective of the total amount of water on the globe, 97.5% of it being salt water, 2.5% of that being fresh water. When you break down the fresh water, most of it is in the glaciers, about a third of it's in the groundwater, and then when you take that tiny sliver that makes up the surface and the atmospheric water, that 0.4%, you see most of that is in freshwater lakes, some in wetlands, some in the atmosphere, some in soil moisture, and some actually in rivers. All right, so the ocean depth is four and a half times as great as average land height. So the ocean is much, much deeper than the, av than the average height of the land above sea level. You know, of course you have the Himalayas and Mount Everest, but the ocean depth is significantly, significantly greater on average. And here are some of the just stupendous uh, statistics that come along with the ocean in terms of its area and its mass and its volume and its average depth uh, and its average temperature, which, by the way, is about 39 degrees Fahrenheit. So the average temperature of the ocean is uh, pretty darn cold. All right. We're going to start talking a little bit about science, marine science or oceanography, the process of discovering unifying principles and data obtained from the ocean, its life forms and its bordering land. So what does it mean? Science is the process of coming up with unifying principles, the principles that unify the way we see our natural world. And we come up with those principles uh, through data, data that we get from the ocean, from the life forms in the ocean and the lands bordering the ocean. So Marine science or oceanography integrates a whole bunch of different types of science, physical oceanographers, chemical, climate, marine biologists, and marine engineers. And that's a brief description of most of those. So science in and of itself is this systematic process of asking questions about the observable world by gathering and studying information. So first and foremost in science is observations. And whether it's uh, Sir Isaac Newton watching the apple fall from the tree, or it's a scientist looking at 25 years of data on tide gauges to see whether there's an indication that high tides are getting higher or high tides are getting lower. Those are all observations. And when you make those observations, you gather that data. When you, when you begin to come up with some explanations for the data, then you're beginning to develop your hypothesis. So science interprets raw data by constructing a general explanation with which all the data is compatible. Maybe not everything. There's always going to be outliers, but a general explanation of, of the data. So that's essentially science. You, you, you observe and you come up with an explanation. Now scientists start with a question based upon something observed or measured. We'll go back to the tide gauges. Are the high tides and the low tides higher than they used to be or are they lower than they used to be? And the working hypothesis is the tentative explanation for the observations or measurements that can be tested and verified by further observations and controlled experiments. So you observe that in the years between 1950 
1985, the highest high tides were at a certain level within a few inches of one another, and the lowest low tides were at a certain level within a few inches. And then you look at data from 1985 to 2015, and you see a gradual increase in those highest high tides and lowest low tides. Your hypothesis is the tentative explanation for those observations, for those measurements that you made. The hypothesis is the explanation for why those measurements are what they are. An experiment is a test that simplifies observations in nature or in the laboratory by manipulating or controlling the conditions under which the observations are made. Now, doing experiments with tides is a little more challenging because it's in nature, it's difficult to have a control situation, but many, many hypotheses can be tested with experimentation. Theory. A hypothesis consistently supported by observation or experiment becomes a theory. So, there is the unifying theory of plate tectonics that tells us that the Earth is made up of a number of large and then smaller plates that are fit together like a jigsaw puzzle that move by one another and slide under one another and run into one another and move away from one another. Lots and lots of observation and lots and lots of experimentation have supported the hypothesis of plate tectonics and now it's a theory. The Big Bang Theory, which we'll talk about, very, very similar. It was a an explanation for an observed phenomenon in the universe and at first it was scoffed at in fact it was laughed at as a matter of fact it was called the big bang as a joke making fun of it oh really the universe was one tiny spot and then all of a sudden it began to expand what like a big bang well once more observations and more experimentation came to support that people started to say huh maybe this is something that's true and now we have a theory now laws are different laws become larger constructs that summarize all experimental observations and laws are things more like gravity things that are just uh, that are much much larger ideas so a law summarizes observations while a theory provides an explanation for the observation so a law basically just says what always happens this always happens the theory provides the explanation for the observations, for why it happens. And generally, we don't create a whole lot of laws in science. We've come to realize that because we have to be able to change our theories as new observations and new data becomes available, that not every law holds holds water forever. As, as, as hard fast as we may hold it at one time, it may have to change later on. So theories must remain open to change uh, if new data is discovered that may change the theory. Laws are really no longer stated as theories r remain open to change. We don't really use laws. We pretty much use theories. And the power of a science lies in its ability to operate in reverse, using a theory or law to predict new facts to be observed, meaning the power of science comes in two things. One, the fact that it, the theories are open to change. If new observations, new abilities to observe come into play, then theories can change. The other power of science is that once we have a theory or a law, we should be able to predict what's going to happen, just like we can predict that the apple will fall from the tree because of our theories and laws that govern the force of gravity. So curiosity is a question that arises about an event or a situation. Observations, what do we see? What happens? How does it happen? Is there a dependable cause and effect relationship at work? A hypothesis is the tentative explanation to propose that data, controlled experiments or plan to prove or disprove potential cause and effect relationships. A good hypothesis should be able to predict future occurrences under similar uh, circumstances. It's that ability to work in reverse. If you have a good hypothesis, you should be able to predict what's going to happen. Experiments, again, are going to are tests undertaken in nature or in the laboratory. Um, they permit manipulating and controlling conditions under which observations are made by controlling them and then let some operating freely you know if the processes that are operating in the, in the experiment that's running freely are the true processes the theory is when patterns emerge if one or more of the relationships hold the hypothesis becomes a theory an explanation for the observations that is accepted by almost all researchers and then a law theories can evolve into larger constructs laws. Laws explain events in nature that occur with unvarying uniformity under identical conditions. Laws summarize experimental observations. 
So one of our big theories uh, explaining how we are or why we are here is the Big Bang Theory. And according to the Big Bang Theory, the universe had its beginning about 13.7 billion years ago. All of the mass and all of the energy, everything that we see around us, everything was concentrated in one uh, minute geometric point at the beginning of space and time. There was no space. There was no time. When that minute, hyper-dense point, geometric point of all mass and all energy and all space and time began to expand, the universe began, and that is the Big Bang. Now, Big Bang. now we don't know what initiated the expansion, but we do know that the universe is continuing to expand today. As a matter of fact, the observations that we make of the universe expanding uh, is, is actually how we develop the theory of, of the Big Bang. So how does this all tie together? Well, because the world's ocean is the largest feature of Earth's surface, scientists believe that the origin of the ocean is likely linked to the origin of Earth. And the origin of Earth is linked to the origin of our solar system. And our solar system is linked to the galaxy. And of course, the galaxies are, are linked to the origin of the universe. Stars spend their lives fusing hydrogen, the lightest, simplest atom element, and a helium, the next heaviest, the next more complex atom or element. And then into heavier and heavier elements. I'm going to show you that on the, um, on the periodic table of the elements. As stars die, at least some stars, very large stars, they will eject these elements into space as they supernova. Only large stars blow up at the end of their lives. When they do, they, uh, they eject all of those heavier elements and all their hydrogen and helium out into the universe as they supernova. So the sun and the planets, our sun and our planets, and all the other suns and planets, or I should say stars and planets and other solar systems, condense from clouds of dust and gas and enriched elements that are the remnants of long ago exploded stars. So if we take that backwards, a star lives its life cycle, it's supernovas. During its life cycle, it has taken hydrogen and fused it into helium. That's the nuclear reaction. That's nuclear fusion. That releases heat and light. Then it fuses helium into heavier and heavier elements until it gets to a point that it becomes so hot because of this fusion that it explodes and those heavier elements and all the dust and gas associated with that star are flung out into space. They create large clouds of dust and gas and enrich elements. Those are called nebulas. And those nebulas condense into new stars and planets. So it's like a recycling center. So our solar system is about halfway out from the center of one of the spiral arms of the galaxy. So what you're looking at is um, the Milky Way galaxy. I'm going to make some, some quick adjustments. And this galactic core right here in the middle, that is not one gigantic star. That is where all the, the, the stars in the center of the galaxy have, have so uh, densely packed together that it looks like one big gigantic star. And this is clearly a spiral galaxy. There are different types of galaxies. This happens to be a spiral galaxy. Um, but that galactic center is just where there's so many stars packed together that it looks like one big point of light. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is that we know that when we look out in space, we are seeing stars certainly out in space, but we're also seeing galaxies. Some of those points of light that we are seeing are galaxies. And we, we began to realize that when we had deep space telescopes like Hubble. And not only are we seeing these galaxies, but looking at the way the white light arrives at Earth from those distant galaxies has told us that all of these galaxies are rushing away from us. And that is, again, how we support the Big Bang Theory, that all these galaxies are actually rushing away from us. All right, now I told you we talked about the periodic table of the elements. So most of the substance of the Earth, its oceans, and all living things is formed in stars. Every chemical element heavier than hydrogen was created and released into space by stars. And our sun, like all normal stars, is powered by nuclear fusion. What we're telling you is that if you take that single element hydrogen, which is the most prevalent element in the universe, that element, if you take, if you take four hydrogen atoms and you use tremendous pressure and tremendous heat, because remember, like objects repel, right? The same sides of a magnet repel each other. So they want to repel one another, those atoms. If you use tremendous heat and, and tremendous pressure, the four hydrogen 
atoms will form into one helium atom. Let's see if I can make an HE on this. But what's most interesting about that process is when the four hydrogen atoms form or forced together, nuclear fusion or forced together to create one helium atom, some of the mass is lost. Now that's going to be an important concept here. Let's look one more time. Get my little marker out. This number, this atomic mass of hydrogen is 1.01, .01, but the atomic mass of helium is 4.0. If you add the mass of four atoms of hydrogen that have to be forced together to make one atom of helium, you get 4.01 atomic mass units. But the atomic mass is, check that, you'll get 4.04 .04 atomic mass units. But the atomic mass of helium is only 4.0. So what happened to that 0 0.04 atomic mass units? Let me see if I can make this happen that those 0 0.04 atomic mass units, they are no longer mass. But the conservation of mass tells us you can't create or destroy mass. You can only transfer it to something else. And what do you transfer it to? You transfer it to energy. That's right. That's where energy comes from. Not the destruction of mass, but the transformation of mass in, nu in a nuclear furnace uh, into, into energy. That is where we get the, the most famous formula in science, E, terrible E, but E equals MC, oops, MC, huh, okay, that's getting bad, squared, where C is the speed of light, speed of light squared, so it goes away, and what that tells us is then energy essentially, not quite equals, but energy essentially equals, so I'll make a squiggly equal sign, mass, and mass and energy are the same thing, they can just be converted back and forth, so when we squish four hydrogen atoms together, that is nuclear fusion. What results is one helium atom and that, that 0.01 mass units of each hydrogen atom that's lost. It's not lost. It's mass turning into energy. And what that energy is, is the radiant energy of the sun, the radiation that comes off the sun, the heat and the light and the gamma rays and the x-rays and the ultraviolet rays and the infrared rays. That is that energy that that mass is converted into. So our sun and all stars are simply just gigantic nuclear fusion furnaces, nuclear fusion engines. They are fusing light elements into heavier elements. And in the end, hydrogen is fused to helium. Helium then with hydrogen is fused into lithium. All three of those are fused into beryllium. And then eventually, if you get a big enough star, you begin to fuse them into boron, which is a super heavy element, 10 times heavier than hydrogen. And if you get a massive star, maybe you begin to fuse it into carbon. But the heat released from that reaction is so tr gigantic, so tremendous, that stars it just can't, there's not enough pressure and heat to fuse it into a heavier element. And it takes a supernova all all of the other elements above carbon, all the other elements are created in supernovas, exploding stars, and then flung out into the universe to eventually collect in nebula and gases and uh, eventually become the next uh, solar nebula or the next, the next star. So this is the solar nebula theory. I realize this print's probably way too small to see, certainly too small for me, but you have your exploded supernova somewhere. This is the gas, the nebula out in the universe. And then uh, gravity begins to pull more and more of that gas and dust and enrich elements to the center. And it begins to spin around it. And as that gas and dust begins to compact toward the center, uh, pressure from gravity and friction from the stuff rubbing against itself, it gets hotter and the higher and higher pressure. And eventually the first hydrogen atoms are fused into helium atoms and when that happens the sun literally turns itself on and the radiant energy that goes out from the sun literally blows all the light elements and all the light dust out of the solar system and all that's left is the chunks that at the same time spinning around the sun accrete or grow together into the the, the planets that we have the inner planets being the heaviest closest to the sun the terrestrial planets and the gas giants being uh, much further away and evidence on Earth and on the Moon and in meteorites that we have uh, we've brought back tells us that this happened 4.6 billion years ago. So the planet building process, 
The accretion of planets occurs when small particles clump into larger masses. In 2006, the International Astronomical Unit defined a celestial body that is in orbit around the sun and has sufficient mass for self-gravity to overcome rigid bodily forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium and that has cleared its neighborhood of, of its, of its, in its orbit. It's cleared all the debris out of its orbit. That can be considered a planet. So what, what does that mean? As the sun turned itself on, the, the radiant energy from the sun blew all the, the dust and the gas and the lighter elements out uh, away from the solar system. Okay, what was left was just the heavier stuff, and it included some gases, and it was all spinning around the sun, all right? So as this was going on, these heavier chunks, the gravity of this big piece, the gravity of this big piece, the gravity of this big piece pulled other pieces in, and as they got bigger and bigger, they had more and more gravity, and they swept up more of the debris around them, and as they went around the sun and got bigger and bigger and bigger, ultimately they got big enough that their own self-gravity, now what does that mean? It means the gravity that they've created because they're so large, their own self-gravity overcomes rigid bodily forces, meaning all the clumps and chunks get pulled into one stable hydrostatic shape, which is a sphere. And so that's what that process is. The International Astronomical Union says a celestial body is a planet if it's in orbit around the sun, one, and it's big enough that its gravity has made it nearly round and it's cleared most of the objects out of its orbit. And all eight of the planets have done that. The one that's not done that, of course, is Pluto. It has objects about the size of itself uh, out there. Uh, Pluto does. And uh, it's also not quite in the right orbit around the sun. It's not in the same type of orbit as all the other planets. So Pluto is no longer a planet. So young Earth was probably homogeneous, all the same stuff. It was created as it grew, flying around the sun, banging into other materials, gravity holding those materials together. It got bigger and bigger and bigger until its self-gravity made it round, but it was just a big blob and chunk of the same stuff. But all that, that interaction with other solar debris and asteroids flying through the solar system in a very active period in the early part of the solar system, all that, all those impacts and the additional gravitational pressure of the Earth becoming large began to cause the Earth to become partially molten. Then, in that partially molten state, the gravity pulled those heavier elements, the iron and nickel, to the center. That also released more heat. And that additional heating caused the lighter elements, like aluminum and silicon uh, and oxygen, to move to the outer part, to the crust of the Earth. And that crust finally began to cool about 4.6 billion years ago. And shortly after that, uh, there was an evidently there was a planetary collision with something about the size of Mars, and that collision caused all that interior part of the Earth, that partially molten part of the Earth, to sort of blow out into space, and then two separate bodies recondensed: the Earth and the Moon. and And that theory comes from the fact that when we brought moon rocks back, the moon rocks were mar largely the same material as the Earth's mantle. So the theory is that the the moon came from the Earth's mantle because of some large planetary collision. So, you know, here's another sort of uh, explanation of how the, the uh, Earth was sorted by density. It grew by the aggregation of particles, meteor and asteroids, uh, bombarded the surface, heating the new planet, adding to its growing mass. Uh, Earth was then composed of basically a mixture of materials, all the same stuff. Um, it lost volume because of gravitational compression and high temperatures in the interior turned the inner earth into a semi-solid mass. The dense iron and nickel moved toward the center because of gravity. Less dense silicates moved outward. Uh, friction generated by this movement heated, movement heated the earth even more. And the result was a density stratification. Stratification basically meaning layers uh, with the, the heavier mantle and the lighter crust. Going back to the beginning of the solar system, once the sun began to fuse those hydrogen into helium, the solar wind stripped any gases that might have been around the Earth. Any gases that may have been there, hydrogen, helium, they got stripped away by the solar wind. That solar wind, the radiation, which is still out there now, stripped all those lighter gases away. So gases that replaced the first atmosphere, the first atmosphere was the helium and hydrogen. It got stripped away when the sun turned itself on like a switch. Gases, including water vapor, were released by the process of outgassing. So outgassing was all that volcanism, all those volcanoes um, 
melting rock and bubbling and gurgling and spitting out gases like uh, water vapor, oxygen, nitrogen, methane, um, and lots and lots of carbon dioxide. Uh, and I said oxygen. That's not correct. So I'm just going to correct myself. Outgassing, outgassing produced water vapor, carbon dioxide, meth methane, and nitrogen. There was no free oxygen at the beginning. So water vapor in the atmosphere, as the whole planet cooled further, condensed into clouds. Eventually, uh, the surface cooled enough for water to be collected in basins. And that's where we think the beginnings of the original oceans came from. But we also think that icy comets and asteroids may have delivered some of the Earth's surface water during that heavy bombardment period, meaning some of those icy comets and asteroids dropped their payloads of ice on the Earth. And that heavy bombardment period probably continued until about 3.8 billion years ago. Now, possibly some of the harshest environments of Earth may have been where um, where where uh, some of the uh, origins of life in that water came from. All right, first, Earth's first atmosphere 4.6 billion years ago is mostly hydrogen and helium, lighter elements, two of the most abundant elements uh, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere at the time and two of the most abundant elements uh, in the, uh, the universe. Uh, they couldn't be held by Earth's gravity and they escaped into space because of the solar wind. The second atmosphere formed through the process of outgassing 4.4 to 4.0 billion years ago, the outpouring of gases from the Earth's interior. Um, lots of gases were pumped into the atmosphere, including water vapor, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. During this time, the cooling of the Earth allowed for the condensation of water vapor and the formation of the oceans, as well as the rise of oxygen. Now, the rise of oxygen came, rise of oxygen came essentially after the outgassing or toward the end of the outgassing. There's also the disassociation of water, um, meaning water molecules broken into hydrogen and oxygen, and also photosynthesis. Photosynthesis added to the rise of oxygen. So those are the two processes that brought oxygen into the ocean first and in the atmosphere. The disassociation of water, breaking down water, hydrogen and oxygen, uh, H2O into its component parts, and then photosynthesis. But of course, in order to have photosynthesis, you had to have the first blue-green algae. As oxygen accumulated between about 2.1 and 1.5 billion years ago, as a result of photosynthesis from the ocean-based plants like algae, our current atmosphere took shape. By about 450 million years ago, about half a billion years ago, there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere to al allow for the development of the ozone layer that was thick enough to protect land animals from ultraviolet light. So that's what it looked like. The far left side of the graph on the x-axis axis is the beginning of time when the sun turned itself on. First atmosphere is unknown, largely thought to have been hydrogen and helium. As the sun turned itself on, that was stripped away. Outgassing produced that water vapor, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, methane, and ammonia. And then between about two and a half and three billion years ago, enough oxygen developed in the oceans and in the uh, that it became free in the atmosphere. And we had that slow rise of of oxygen. One of the things you have to recognize is you can see the carbon dioxide being drawn down almost immediately by plants, by, by uh, algae, but there was no oxygen in the atmosphere because first that oxygen had to attack. Oxygen is a big organic element, uh, a molecule. It attacks things. That's why we get iron oxide, rust, or any of the other oxides. It always has to attach itself to something and break that thing down. Uh, and so first oxygen had to attack all the metals in the uh, the rocks and in the ocean and oxidize them. That's where we got the red rocks, like the red rocks of Sedona. Um, and then oxygen began to develop in the atmosphere. So the rise of oxygen was really quite an important event uh, in the world's history. We went from no oxygen to oxygen attacking iron, leaving vast amounts of rust and then red rocks. And then it moved into the atmosphere. And more important than moving into the atmosphere that we could breathe it was the fact that it created this layer around the Earth that shielded the Earth from ultraviolet radiation because the oxygen O2 formed oxygen O3, which is ozone. And that ozone blocked out the uh, infrared radiation, the, uh, the, the ultraviolet light. Not the infrared, but the ultraviolet. Uh, and that ultraviolet light, had it not been blocked, nothing could have ever lived on land. No plants, no animals could have ever lived on land. Because of the ozone layer, we can. So this is some of the fossils uh, from Australia from three and a half billion years ago. That's some of the fossilization that we found. Pretty cool stuff, I think. If anyone ever tells you the climate on the Earth isn't changing, you can just know that the climate has always changed. Four billion years ago, we had a hydrogen and helium. Then we had carbon dioxide and methane and nitrogen. And then blue-green algae showed up. And first they ate all the iron, and then they... Well, the oxygen ate all the iron, and then the oxygen got out in the atmosphere. It protected the Earth from the from the ultraviolet, and it's just been one constant change. So, 
Um, what's going to happen to our sun? It was four and a half, four point eight billion years ago that it started. Theoretically, in about five billion years, it's going to die. Um, it's going to continue to get hotter and hotter as it as it fuses heavier and heavier elements. Those heavier elements releasing more and more energy. Uh, and eventually, it'll get so hot, it'll begin to expand, and it will likely expand uh, to about the orbit of Earth um, when it becomes a red giant. Um, it's not expected to supernova, not big enough to supernova, but it would get to a red giant phase uh, and then would likely um, collapse upon itself because the, the weight of its mass will become um, create more gravity than the, the, the outward pressure of the heat would have. It will collapse upon itself, becoming a white dwarf, and then eventually go dark, becoming a black dwarf, but uh, not a good prospect for planet Earth in that, uh, in that last billion years. All right, so here's the timeline of Earth. We'll go back to 13 billion years ago with the Big Bang. Um, the solar, solar nebula begins about 5.5 billion years ago. Earth forms about 4.6 billion years ago. Uh, 4.2 billion, you get the ocean. Oldest rocks about 3.8. That's when the surface cooled enough. First evidence of light about 3.6. Uh, rise of oxygen about 2 billion years ago. Um, atmosphere uh, reaches a steady state about 0.8 billion years ago. About 800 million years ago, you get the first animals. Then the first fish about 500 million. Then the first, uh, well, Pangaea begins to break apart about 220, 210 million years ago. Um, about 66 million years ago, at the end of the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs dying allowed the mammals to rise. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. I'm not so sure about that 3 million on humans. I think we're thinking more closer to 7 million now. Uh, and uh, and here we are today, 3.5 billion years from now, the sun's output will be too low uh, uh, for liquid water ocean. Uh, and then eventually the sun will um, basically expand and, and destroy itself. All right, so... Back to the ocean. What do you need for an ocean world? You need a nearly circular orbit with a distance from the star providing the appropriate temperature um, for there to be a range of, of water, frozen, liquid, and gas. It's got to be a single star, which is not typical. Most solar systems are binary systems, two stars. Uh, it has to have a fairly regular orbit like the one we have, nearly circular, um, and a fairly neat, narrow seasonal range, which, which we have. Um, the materials that accrete to form the planet must have uh, must have water and solid material to form a crust, and the planet must be large enough to produce gravity to hold the water on its surface. Are there other bodies of uh, that have uh, water? Well, Europa, one of the um, the moons of Jupiter, uh, appears to have uh, ice, and the planetary pull of Jupiter being so great that it actually twists this the inside of this planet to keep it warm enough to keep a liquid water underneath the surface, although the surface appears to be just ice. Uh, but uh, that's one body that appears to have liquid water on it. Uh, Mars appears as though it has had at different times liquid water on it and solid water as well. And of yeah, course, there's are. the moon. All right, so uh, it's 1998. Ice was discovered um, on the moon's south pole. Titan, Saturn's largest moon, probably has an ocean of hydrocarbons, and believe that or not. And Mars also had a thick atmosphere early on, much like Earth's, but it got... Um, it was too far away from the sun. It, it couldn't hold that atmosphere. One of the reasons why it couldn't hold that atmosphere is because um, Mars does not have a, a molten center. And because of that, it doesn't have a, gravita a gravitational field. And without the gravitational field, it couldn't protect its atmosphere from the solar wind. So its, its atmosphere got blown away. Um, but um, yeah, other, other celestial bodies definitely have water on them. All right, wrapping this up. Earth is a water planet. Um, possibly one of only a few in the galaxy, but uh, the concept of exoplanets, other planets outside of our solar system has come into vogue here in the last 10 years, and we're finding more and more planets that may be similar. Uh, the ocean covers a big chunk of the Earth's surface um, and uh, it dominates the Earth. The average depth, depth, again, is four and a half times the average height of the continents above sea level, and life almost certainly evolved uh, in the ocean. Uh, we study our planet using the scientific method. Again, the scientific method is that systematic process of asking and answering questions about the natural world. Marine science applies the scientific method to the ocean, living organisms, and the lands around it. Uh, most of the atoms that make up the Earth and its inhabitants were formed in stars. Stars form uh, in, uh, in nebula, and they spend their lives changing hydrogen into helium and heavier elements. When they die, some, the larger stars, eject those elements into space, when supernovas, and it's those elements being injected into space that create those clouds of dust and gases, nebula, that create new stars and solar systems. So basically, 
the universe is one big recycling plant. And Earth formed by the accretion of cold particles about 4.6 billion years ago. Heat from debris banging into Earth, radioactive decay, heat that was uh, caused by friction, partially melted the planet. It was density stratified. Heavy materials sank to the center. Light materials moved out to the crust. The ocean formed a little bit later. Water vapor trapped in the Earth's outer layers escaped to the surface through volcanic activity as well as carbon dioxide and nitrogen, uh, nitrous oxide. Life very likely originated in the ocean um, soon after the ocean was formed. Now, there are some, some theories that say perhaps life arrived on one of those icy comets, but we don't know. We don't know for sure. Um, and although we know of no other planet with a similar ocean, um, there is lots of, uh, lots of water in interstellar clouds uh, and other water planets are very possible out there in the solar system. All right. Primary concept. The ocean didn't prevent the spread of humanity, but it actually helped in the spread of humanity. As a matter of fact, by the time the European explorers set out to discover the new world, most native people have already, had already spread out across much of the world. Um, we also need to understand that any culture that was able to build rafts or small boats or have skills of small boat navigation, they had the economic and the nutritional advantage over less skilled competitors. So it evolved as a way to maximize access to resources, seafaring did. So periods of extensive maritime exploration and the marine projection of political power by nations, that all preceded scientific investigation. So it was all about exploration and political power, then later seafaring became about scientific investigation. A couple of investigations we're going to talk about. Uh, Captain James Cook, you probably heard about him. The British Royal Navy, they were probably the first ones to apply the principles of scientific investigation to the ocean. There was the HMS Challenger, which was the first extensive expedition that was dedicated totally to research. And then modern oceanography, which is developed and guided by a whole huge group of institution and governments, not just individuals on single expeditions. In the past, there were individuals that struck out to learn stuff. Now it's sort of guided by institutions and governments. So early people traveled the ocean for economic reasons. It offered them the benefit of mobility and greater access to food supplies. If they had that raft building or small boat navigation skill, they had an economic and a nutritional advantage over competitors. The first direct evidence we have of voyaging, traveling on the ocean for a specific purpose, comes from the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the Egyptians organized shipborne commerce on the Nile. The first regular ocean traders out into the Mediterranean, the Cretans or the Phoenicians, who they kind of took over maritime supremacy in the Mediterranean, and the Phoenicians did after the destru destruction of the Cretan civilization around 1200 before current era, BCE, pretty much the same as BC. The Phoenicians traveled right to the Strait of Gibraltar, which took them out into the Atlantic Ocean. And they made it as far as, let's say, um, the British Isles and down the west coast of Africa. The Greeks, they began to explore outside the Mediterranean and into the Atlantic Ocean about 900 to 700 years before the current era, B.C. And once the Greeks got going, we started seeing the development of cartographers. We saw the founding of the Library of Alexandria and our Erasinides, who was a librarian, um, he, de he developed some very significant concepts and understandings, including longitude and latitude, and the fact that the, the world was a globe, uh, and uh, he, he began to understand the size of the world. So cartographers are chart makers or map makers. That's what a cartographer is. Cartography is map making. And those cartographers recorded information about locations and landmarks and ocean currents, the Library of Alexandria was founded in the third century before the current era BC. And this, this library stored information on every aspect of human endeavor. It was massive and its destruction really um, stopped the development of humans for almost, almost a thousand years. And then the librarian, the second librarian at Alexandria, and this guy, he was able to, to calculate the circumference of the earth. He invented this system of longitude and latitude, so there's a massive use of the ocean to really begin to understand the globe, the world, uh, in, this, in this thousand years or so before BC, before the current era. And of course, the principles of celestial navigation were invented right there at the library of, uh, at Alexandria. So this is how he determined the, um, 
the circumference of the globe, just basic trigonometry. So he, um, he recognized that the sun was very far away. And so that meant that the sun's rays came in to the earth nearly parallel. And he also knew, basically noticed, observed, which is what scientific, you know, the scientific uh, process is, making observations. He observed that on the longest day of the year, the solstice, um, that the sun's rays went straight down into this vertical well uh, in the city he lived in. And he also knew that about, in, in, in their terms, 785 kilometers away, they, they knew that distance, was another city in which a pole sticking straight up cast about a seven degree shadow. And so if you use basic trigonometry, if you draw a straight line down the well to the center of the earth, uh, and another straight line parallel to that, that seven degree angle and that shadow being cast in that pole, if you use the concept of um, opposite angles that cross over two parallel lines, um, opposite angles are equal, then you know that there's a seven degree angle between the, um, the well uh, and that pole. And that seven degree angle is about one fiftieth of a circle. So you know the distance from the well to the pole is one fiftieth of a circle or one fiftieth of the circumference of the earth. And um, back in 230 BCE, he was able to determine the circumference of the earth within about 8% of its true value. This is just a, an amazing example of the knowledge that was, that was uh, kept at the Library of Alexandria. And again, most of it having been developed through maritime uh, exploration. In 220 BC, uh, this was the world, according to the Library of Alexandria. And you can see there are actual lines uh, crossing the map, uh, north to south and east to west. Those are the beginnings of the lines of latitude, the lines that go from east to west, and the lines of longitude, the lines that go from north to south. Uh, and in, in this chart, and you can actually even see just how well they understood the general shapes of the continents. You can see Italy and Spain. You can see where the British Isles are. Africa is known as, Lib uh, as Libya and then Arabia and then India. All pretty good understanding of the actual shapes and even the distances. But these lines of longitude and latitude were put through um, cities and, and important locations. And they weren't evenly spaced out as the lines of latitude and longitude are now. Uh, and they put Alexandria at the mouth of the Nile right there in the center. So let's talk a little bit about latitude and longitude. Lines of latitude and longitude are the imaginary lines that we draw on the globe to allow us to pinpoint a location on the globe. Lines of latitude are parallel to the equator and they run from east to west, but they are stacked from north to south. And you can see that on the far left. The zero line of latitude is the equator. 30 degrees north latitude is a 30 degree angle running from the equator to the center of the earth and from a point near Jacksonville, Florida to the center of the earth. And then 60 degrees is further north and of course the North Pole is at 90 degrees. Those are lines of latitude. They are parallel to one another and they run from north to south. The lines themselves go around the world, east to west, west to east, and they are stacked from north to south. Longitude is a little bit of a different beast. When you're trying to decide what's going to be the zero line of, of uh, latitude. It's pretty easy to do. You, you use the center of the earth right there in the middle. That'll be the zero line. So that's the equator. But how do you come up with the zero or the prime meridian? Lines of longitude are sometimes called meridians. How do you come up with that prime meridian, that zero line? Where do you put it? So back in the time when these decisions were being made, England was the powerhouse in the world, and so the decision was made to, to make that prime meridian run through England. And the city of choice was the city of, Grin, of, of Greenwich. Uh, so that's where the concept of, of Greenwich Mean Time comes from, Greenwich Mean Time or the prime meridian. That is where the zero degree longitude line is. And the lines of longitude go around the world from north to south, and they're stacked from east to west. And as you go west from Greenwich, you're in the Western Hemisphere. As you go east from Greenwich, you're in the Eastern Hemisphere. That's how the United States is a Western culture. Anything west of Greenwich is in the Western Hemisphere, and it goes around 180 degrees. Uh, 10 degrees 
west longitude, 20, 30, 40, 60 degrees west longitude, all the way around to the back side of the globe in the Pacific Ocean, where it's the zero, the 180 degree west longitude. And then it starts in zero at Greenwich Mean and goes east as well, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 degrees east longitude. And the thing about the longitude lines is they converge at the poles, so they are not parallel to one another. The Polynesian Triangle is this concept of how the original peoples moved across the Pacific Ocean. And the ancestors of the actual Polynesians, who we think inhabited the Hawaiian Islands, theoretically spread from Southeast Asia or Indonesia to the east, to New Guinea, and then the Philippines. And they had done that by about 20,000 years ago. But the mid-Pacific Islands, a little further out, they had been colonized about 2,500 years ago. Uh, and that would happen through this huge movement of what we refer to as a Polynesian Triangle. And if you look at this Polynesian Triangle, it's bisected by the equator. And north and south of the equator, the trade winds blow from the east, northeast trade winds, southeast trade winds, which means the prevailing winds across this section of the massive Pacific Ocean are from east to west. And so the, the theory of the Polynesian colonization is that the, uh, the original inhabitants of Southeast Asia uh, and uh, the New Guinea area, they would sail into the wind until they ran into an island. But if they got to a point where they did run into an island and they were running out of uh, food and water, then they would just simply turn around and let the prevailing trade winds blow them back to their original location. But this is, this is the theory as to how the original indigenous people spread from Southeast Asia and spread to the east across the uh, the Pacific Ocean. And this also includes uh, those that went all the way over to Easter Island and, of course, the Hawaiian Islands. Here's an example of a Viking ship from about 900 um, AD. And uh, basically, this is a reconstruction. The painting is a reconstruction from a ship that was found at the bottom of a, a Norwegian fort back in 1880. Um, and it's just a very standard setup for an ocean going vehicle, but the uh, Norwegians, uh, or I should say the Vikings, had um, tremendous success in their era uh, in conquest and because they had an understanding and ideas about seafaring and shipbuilding. The Chinese were the first to invent an actual compass, which is what you can see in the lower left, and, and that was uh, used to, to point them to true north. And they use that to have some idea where they're going and which direction they are going. They also, the Chinese, uh, were able to develop the central rudder and watertight compartments and sails. And not only sails, but multiple masted ships. And their mastery of uh, seafaring techniques and shipbuilding allowed the Chinese to be massively wealthy and really spread their civilization uh, across much of Asia and the Western Pacific. So the Chinese undertook some serious, serious organized voyages of discovery. Um, and in the 1400s, early 1400s, they moved into the Indian Ocean through Indonesia uh, and then off to the tip of Africa. Um, and again, they were able to do this because of these, uh, these advances that they had developed in shipbuilding of central rudders and watertight compartments and multiple masts. So uh, you can read the details in the book of their, uh, of their movement across the Indian Ocean uh, over toward um, northern Africa. But again, it was, a, it was a significant event and it really allowed them to garner tremendous amounts of wealth. And there is the map of the, uh, the origin of all seven voyages being there uh, in the middle of the Ming Empire. And they came around uh, through Thailand and um, through Indonesia, between Malaysia and Sumatra over to the southern tip of India, and then on up into Arabia, and then eventually around that northern tip of Africa, as far south as almost into Tanzania. And all these stops, they were able to, uh, to trade and um, learn and take on tremendous amounts of wealth. And it's a big part of the spread of this Chinese civilization. Europe also had an age of discovery, um, and that was during the Renaissance period. Uh, most well-known was Henry the Navigator, and uh, he was able to compile detailed charts as he explored the west coast of Africa. Uh, he did some very impressive explorations. And then, of course,
Christopher Columbus, who actually never saw the mainland of North America, but um, his adventures inspired all those other people that did sail to the New World. And you've probably heard of Ferdinand Magellan. Uh, and even though he died attempting to circum circumnavigate the world, um, his crew, well, a very, very small part of his crew, actually was successful in circumnavigating the globe. About uh, 260 sailors set sail in that attempt out of Portugal uh, in the 50, early 1500s, um, but only 18 of those sailors actually arrived back uh, a few years later. All right, James Cook, well known. Uh, one of the things that James Cook was really well known for was making friends with uh, the Polynesian, the Polynesian people all across the Pacific. But in the end, it was something he did that offended them on the big island of Hawaii uh, that he met his doom, as he just basically had his head lopped off one day because he had uh, broken one of their taboos. So James Cook was a commander in the British Royal Navy, and he's credited with leading voyages that really tremendously contributed to scientific oceanography. So beyond the spread of political power and the, uh, uh, and the acquiring of wealth, Cook's, Cook's voyages were mostly about scientific discovery. Some of the things that uh, he discovered, he, uh, he was able to, while out at sea and observing the planets and the stars, he verified calculations of planetary orbits. He was able to chart New Zealand and the Great Barrier Reef and Tonga and the Easter Islands. Um, he was able to, as I said, initiate these friendly relations with many of the native populations. He did a, a, an amazing amount of sampling of marine life and uh, land and land and plants, land plants and uh, land animals. And he also uh, did a lot of recording of data with regards to the ocean floor in geologic formations. Um, then we moved into a period in which it wasn't individuals undergoing exploration, but it was governments undergoing exploration. The United States Exploring Expedition was launched in 1838, and it was a naval slash scientific expedition. Um, the HMS Beagle, where Charles Darwin served as a naturalist, went to South America and also into the Pacific Islands. And this is a, a chart of the HMS Challenger, which between 1872 and 1876 was the first oceanic expedition that was dedicated solely to scientific research. And it, it, it had a, uh, an amazing trip. All right, in the 20th century, as you might expect, we had tremendous advancements in ocean exploration. There were polar uh, expeditions, charting and mapping both the North and the South Pole. Uh, the Meteor, which was a ship, was the first expedition to use modern optics and electronic equipment for oceanographic investigation, including the mapping of the seafloor. The Atlantis uh, was a research vessel that, that confirmed the presence of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And we're going to talk in detail about the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and why knowing it's there has been such a monumental advance in our understanding of the Earth's geology. Uh, and then we had these uh, bathyspheres and bathyscapes, which were submersibles that descended uh, into the Challenger, uh, the, in the Challenger Deep, which is another one, uh, that went down into the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest trench in the, in the ocean. It's over in the Pacific Ocean. It's where two plates converge and create a deep ocean trench. And the Challenger was also able to obtain samples um, by drilling. It was a drilling ship. And the samples that the, that drilling ship pulled up also able to provide some confirming evidence for this concept of seafloor spreading. The mid-ocean or the mid-Atlantic ridge is where the seafloor is spreading and the Challenger was able to drill and get the evidence of seafloor spreading. So massive advancements in ocean exploration occurred in the 20th century. Um, and again, here's just a quick uh, recap of the things we just talked about with the Meteor Expedition, the Challenger, uh, the Glomar Challenger that drilled the ocean floor. And that was in 1968. So it was 1968, which probably seems like a long time ago to you, but I was seven years old. And, and that is when we really first began to use ocean expedition and information to uh, get an idea of what was actually happening on the seafloor. So briefly, we'll talk a little bit about some of the technology used in the 20th century to make these advancements. The first being the echo sounder, the ability to map 
the ocean floor using uh, sound waves. And uh, the fact that the sound waves have emanated from the, uh, the, the ship, pointing straight down, they're going to bounce off the seafloor and travel back up to the ship. And if the ship has a listening device, uh, it can determine the time that it takes the echo to travel from the ship to the seafloor and back up. Uh, and you can get the depth of the ocean using that technology, uh, beaming sound waves to the bottom and measuring the time required for the sound wave to bounce back to the ship. So if that round trip uh, our, uh, time is known, the distance to the bottom can be calculated, and this technique was first used on a large scale by the German research vessel Meteor back in the 1920s. Some institutions that have uh, come to be that basically oversee the large-scale complex research projects, and some of these that you've likely heard of, like Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and then Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University, all major institutions that have um, hundreds of millions, if not billions, in research dollars in play uh, almost at any given time to try and allow us to know more about uh, the ocean world. There's also NASA, National Aeronautic and Space Administration. Uh, there is also NOAA, the no National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, and uh, NASA was instrumental uh, in launching, of course, those first oceanographic satellites that gave us an understanding of wave heights, sea surface temperatures, uh, sea surface heights themselves, sea level changes. Um, satellite altimetry can give us very, very exact data on wave heights and the sea level heights and sea surface temperatures. And all these things help us to understand, uh, again, maybe the impact of, of warming on the Earth or, or what's going on with El Nino uh, and then, of course, also uh, what's happening with ocean waves. And then uh, NOAA was instrumental in creating the, some of the robotic devices that have been used in undersea exploration. Here are the satellite projects, uh, Topex, Jason, Aqua. Aqua and Terra are two satellites that fly in a polar orbit. Uh, and you can uh, basically, if you're a Google Aqua satellite, uh, you can get a daily um, group of pictures taken by those uh, polar orbiting satellites. And what's different about polar orbiting satellites from the uh, geosynchronous orbiting satellites that they use for weather and the GPS satellites for global positioning is those polar orbiting satellites orbit at a much, much lower altitude. And so the pictures are very high definition, very, very interesting, something you may actually want to take a look at at some time. And this is the NASA A-Train, the string of satellites that orbit the Earth one behind the other on the same track they are spaced just a few minutes apart, so their collective observations may be used to build three-dimensional images of the Earth's atmosphere, its ocean surface, and land tech, uh, topography. This is that graphical information that GIS, uh, which is a whole new industry and a massive industry opening up uh, for those interested uh, in this type of physical science. So that pretty much wraps up Chapter 2. Chapter 3 is huge. It's gigantic, right? It's, uh, it's all about... Uh, the, the Earth and its structure, and specifically plate tectonics and the role that plate tectonics uh, played in creating the ocean basins that we know today. That was the lecture and ocean world from Essentials of Oceanography, the 8th edition, brought to you by Cengage Learning and written by Tom Garrison and Robert Ellis. I'm Dave Cacciarella, and we're going to continue with our study of oceanography taking a look at plate tectonics and then getting into the ocean floor itself.